Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone, uh, colleagues and, uh, and witnesses and our, our visitors. Uh, I call this hearing to order and will keep my opening remarks uh, very brief uh, because it's uh, so important today that we hear from those uh, behind the dais who have, not from us behind the dais, but those witnesses who have powerful stories that will resonate with each of us. Uh, to our witnesses, um, I've met most of you. I will look forward to having a conversation with you afterwards if that's desirable. But thank you for being here today to share your experiences with this subcommittee. Uh, I speak for all of us when I say that we're uh, grateful for your representation of the United States of America, uh, that you did so well, and that uh, you've done uh, so many things good outside even your sport. We appreciate your willingness to spend your afternoon with us in discussing ways that we can better uh, protect our athletes. Uh, I believe we all wish to see um, Americans successful in international competitions and understand the value of encouraging young athletes to participate in our nation's thriving sports culture. This subcommittee, which exercises jurisdiction over the U.S. Olympic Committee and amateur sports, is fully committed to ensuring the health and safety of all American athletes from youth sports to Olympians. In January, Senator Blumenthal and I launched a bipartisan subcommittee investigation to examine cultural and systemic problems regarding abuse after serious and disturbing revelations that former USA gymnastics team Dr. Larry Nasser sexually abused hundreds of athletes over two decades, even well after survivors alerted authorities about his actions. Together, we have sought extensive documentation from the U.S. Olympic Committee, from USA Gymnastics, and from, Mich and from Michigan State University regarding uh, this, speci this specific case. To further expand the investigation, we've requested written documentation from all national governing bodies on their policies and procedures in reporting, handling, and combating abuse, and their use of uh, athlete organization non-disclosure agreements. Today's hearing represents the next step in our investigation. The ranking member and I met with several athletes earlier this year, including two of our witnesses here today, and we felt it was absolutely necessary to have your experiences shared with the subcommittee. I'm also eager to hear our witnesses' advice and recommendations on what Congress ought to be doing to make certain athletes are protected from predators and can freely participate in their sport without fear of abuse. I appreciate the incredible bravery of our witnesses and their willingness to be here to discuss these sensitive topics. You are all enormously talented and successful athletes who made your country proud, but were taken for granted by the organizations you represented. You were let down by individuals you trusted, but who chose to ignore you, to look the other way, or to deliberately cover up the abuses you suffered because their priority, simply put, was not your safety or your well-being. Thank you for your time that you've taken to prepare and to present your testimony today. And finally, while she's not here today, another abuse survivor, Michaela Maroney, has submitted written testimony to the subcommittee. Ms. Maroney, as many of you know, is another Olympic gold medal winning gymnast abused by Larry Nasser, and whom was alleged to have been silenced from speaking out by USA Gymnastics through an NDA. I ask unanimous consent that her testimony be entered into the record without objection. With that, I now turn to the ranking member of the subcommittee, uh, Senator Blumenthal, for his opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, the faces and voices that we're going to see and hear today give new meaning to the word courage and sacrifice. A year and a half ago, you stepped forward, along with others, to give those faces and voices to a cause which continues to shock us and to sadden the nation. There's very little these days that seems to shock this nation, but your experiences and others that have been recounted now still elicit that emotion. Fortunately, the survivors of abuse across Olympic sports deserve our thanks, and if I have one message for the folks who are testifying today. It is the gratitude of our nation, our Senate, our committee for coming forward and continuing to be part of this effort at reform. And it has to be a continuing crusade. This hearing is just one more step. 
I want to thank Chairman Moran and the Chairman of our committee, uh, Senator Thune, as well as the Ranking Member, Senator Nelson, for giving us this authority and platform to move forward. How was this abuse allowed to continue over so many years? What systematically allowed it to happen? How can we prevent it from happening to any athlete, again, not only in gymnastics, but now as we're learning in other sports where young people can be victimized by predators who have so shocked the nation? A number of young athletes in your position felt that speaking out would mean the end of their careers, their reputations, and their opportunity for athletic glory, particularly Olympic glory. Some were discouraged or told they couldn't be helped. Circumstances reached a level that even ath uh, elite athletes suffering abuse were afraid to speak out. How do we create a system that encourages truth-telling, speaking truth to power, rather than hiding it? Two of those courageous voices are here today, Olympic medalists, Jordan Weber and Jamie Dancher. Uh, Ms. Weber is a 2012 gold medalist and a member of what the media dubbed the Fierce Five. Ms. Dantzler is a 2000 bronze medalist. <coughs> These awards are distinctions, athletic distinctions, for ability and perseverance and hard work, but they deserve medals for courage and stamina in speaking out and standing up and their courage in testifying numerous times, not just here. I'd like to thank uh, Michaela Moroni as well. She's a 2012 gold medalist and a member of the Fierce Five for her courage in submitting her written testimony for the official record. Her experience also points to systematic problems that need to be addressed because they will enable continued abuse. I want to say very bluntly, of particular concern to me are the reports that the USAG actively sought to silence Ms. Moroni with a non-disclosure agreement in response to a lawsuit she filed against the U.S. Olympic Committee, USA Gymnastics, and Michigan State University. Their multiple organizational failures to properly investigate, discipline, or remove abusers after complaints of sexual abuse are absolutely unconscionable. This non-disclosure agreement shows the hazards and dangers and damage that can be caused by those kinds of enforced concealment agreements. It would impose a $100,000 fine if the victim were to violate its confidentiality clause by speaking out about the sexual abuse, as Chairman Moran has mentioned. As we continue this investigation, we're seeking answers about Ms. Moroni's story and others that have been silenced. So let me just say finally, across Olympic sports, there are stories of young athletes who have been victimized and have survived physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, it's an undeniable reality. We want to fight it and correct it and prevent it from happening again. And again, my thanks to Chairman Moran and Chairman Thune and Ranking Member Nelson, and most important, thank you to the survivors for your incredible courage in sharing your experiences and your stories and supporting others who have done so as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Blumenthal. Um, a couple of um, observations. Uh, first of all, there's a vote now scheduled at 4.30, uh, and uh, we would hope to have uh, our hearing concluded by the time of that vote. Uh, secondly, uh, Senator Blumenthal is correct. This is an ongoing uh, investigation. Uh, I would uh, make uh, my fellow committee members aware, uh, as well as others, that we have uh, identified May the 22nd as our next hearing. 
we are in the process of inviting, but to date we have notified the USA uh, Gymnastics as well as uh, the United States Olympic Committee and Michigan State of our intention to have a hearing that would involve their participation as witnesses on that date. Um, so it is work in progress, but uh, it is uh, one of the next steps that the subcommittee intends to take. Uh, with that, uh, let me introduce, although uh, the ranking member did a, a, an admirable job of introducing our witnesses, uh, our witnesses today are Ms. Uh, Jordan Weber, a gymnast and gold, Olympic gold medalist from 2012, London. Uh, Ms. Jamie Dancher, gymnast and Olympic bronze medalist, Sydney in 2000. Ms. Uh, uh, Bridie Farenhull, a speed skater and 2014 Olympic hopeful. And Mr. Craig Morisi, a figure skater. Uh, with that, uh, we'll take uh, your testimony uh, of approximately five minutes, and if there's things that you want to add to, to, to the record, uh, we'd be glad to have uh, additional comments in writing. Ms. Dancher. Chairman Moran, Ranking Member Blumenthal, distinguished members of the committee, I am honored to appear before you today. One year ago, I testified in front of the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee in support of legislation to protect child athletes from sexual abuse in gymnastics and other Olympic sports. That legislation is now law, and I want to thank all of the members of Congress and both parties who voted for it. I was the first Olympic athlete to come forward publicly and reveal Nasser's long history of abuse, and sadly, I was not the last. We now know that for the 2012 Fierce Five, gold medal gymnasts are Nasser survivors including my sister survivor, Jordan Weber. I let the world know that the former Olympic team doctor, Nassar, abused me at the USA National Training Center in Texas. He abused me in California and during gymnastics competitions all over the world. He even abused me in my hotel room in Sydney at the Olympic Games. I now understand that through all of that time, USA Gymnastics had policies that prohibited adults from being alone in hotel rooms with children, but they didn't enforce the policies. I knew at that time that speaking out would not be easy or painless. Back in 2000, as a teenager, I had the audacity to speak out against the abusive training methods employed by Bella and Marta Caroli, and I suffered criticism from USA Gymnastics staff, coaches, and the media. I believe that speaking out was my right. I believe that this abuse was allowed to happen because many adults at USA Gymnastics, the United States Olympic Committee, Michigan State University, and in various gyms throughout the country kept Larry Nassar's secret. They failed to speak up and they let Nassar assault children. I have numerous nieces and nephews. I could not look at them any longer and stay quiet. I knew as a former Olympian that if I spoke, people might be more likely to speak up as well. As it turned out, I was right. In the summer of 2016, I began to understand that Larry Nassar had sexually abused me and his procedures were not legitimate medical treatment. I further came to learn that he had been quietly dismissed by USA Gymnastics based upon allegations that he had sexually abused minors on our Olympic and national women's gymnastics teams. His firing was kept quiet by USA Gymnastics, and he was allowed to post messages on social media that he said he had retired. I decided to seek justice, not just for myself, but to protect others. Initially, I filed a lawsuit as a Jane Doe, but I did give an interview to the Indianapolis Star when my case was filed. Almost immediately after filing, I was bullied on social media. My name was put on various social media sites by NASAR supporters who were either told or figured out my identity. A senior USAG official actually sent me a Facebook petition she was circulating to support Larry Nassar. Others attacked me personally, questioning my motives, my character, my morals, and even my sanity. Attorneys working for USA Gymnastics called former boyfriends and tried to dig up dirt on me, asking very personal and detailed questions about my sex life. They blamed my parents and generally attacked my character. This upset me greatly. I had done nothing wrong except speak the truth about what happened to me as a little girl. 
Their response was to blame the victim. USA Gymnastics put on an immediate statement about my lawsuit. They said they found out about Dr. Nassar's misconduct in 2015 and immediately contacted law enforcement. A few months later, we found out that that was a lie. USA Gymnastics has now admitted that they waited more than five weeks before contacting the FBI, and the FBI waited a year before contacting any of the survivors or their families. During that time, Larry Nassar went back to his clinic at MSU and continued to molest children. I began to learn that I was not alone. Almost immediately, other girls and women began to come forward with stories disturbingly similar to mine. I learned through the media that there were dozens, if not hundreds, of victims. Today, more than 250 women have already come forward in court and to law enforcement. All have told stories that are disturbingly similar to mine. Larry Nassar was convicted criminally, first on federal charges for child pornography, then on state charges for criminal sexual conduct. He has been sentenced to 300 years in prison. USA Gymnastics has also been to court attempting to dismiss claims by more than 200 women by contending that they had no legal duty to prevent Nassar's abuse or tell us that he was an abuser. I sat through the depositions of USA Gymnastics President Steve Penny and other USAG officials. I was stunned by the way their lawyers fought to prevent them from answering any meaningful questions about what they knew and when they knew it. I was disgusted by their answers when they did answer questions. Their answers were either misleading or attempted to justify their misconduct. I urge the committee to read these depositions and question Mr. Penny and other USAG officials under oath. Maybe they will answer tough questions and tell you the truth. I hope they do. This is a case of powerful people protecting other powerful people. It is up to you as powerful members of the United States Senate to hold them accountable, and I believe you will. Thank you for listening to all of us. Thank you very much for your, your comments and your testimony. Uh, Ms. Weaver. Good afternoon, Chairman Moran, Ranking Member Blumenthal, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I thought that training for the Olympics would be the hardest thing I would ever do. But in fact, the hardest thing I've had to do is process that I'm a victim of Larry Nassar. It's caused me to feel shame and confusion. I spent months trying to think back at my experience and wonder how I didn't know what was happening to me and how I was betrayed by Larry Nassar and everyone at USA Gymnastics and the US Olymp Olympic Committee, organizations sanctioned by the federal government whom I trusted to be on my side. I started seeing Larry Nassar at the age of eight years old in my hometown of Lansing. He was the best gymnastics doctor in the world. Everyone at my gymnastics, gymnastics club on the US national team and across the country saw Larry and everyone said the same thing. He was a miracle worker and he could fix just about anything. I was treated by Larry for any and all of my injuries from ages eight to 18 and it wasn't long before he had gained my trust. He became a safe person of sorts. To my teenage self, he appeared to be the good guy in an environment that was intense and restricting. He would try to advise me on how to deal with the stresses of training and my coaches. At the Crowley Ranch, the National Team Training Center, our Olympic team athletes were motivated by fear. Fear of being treated as invisible if you didn't perform to their standards. We couldn't smile or laugh during training. We were even afraid to eat too much in front of our coaches who were pressured to keep us thin even though we were doing extremely rigorous exercise for up to 35 hours a week. Bear in mind, this is happening to little girls as young as nine years old. This toxic environment was the perfect place for predator like Larry Nassar to flourish, and he did. Larry acted like our friend. He always had a sympathetic ear for complaints about our coaches. He would bring us food and coffee at the Olympics when we were hungry. I didn't know that these were all grooming techniques that he used to manipulate and brainwash me into trusting him. When I was 14 years old, I tore my hamstring in my right leg. This was when he started performing the procedure that we're all, all now familiar with. I would cringe at how uncomfortable it felt. 
He did it time after time, appointment after appointment, convincing me that it was helping my hamstring injury. The worst part was that I had no idea he was sexually abusing me for his own benefit. I knew that it felt strange, but after all, he was the national team doctor. I knew that if I questioned his treatment, I would risk my chance at making the Olympic team or being chosen to compete internationally. After all, Larry was recommended by the national team staff, and he treated us monthly at all of our national team camps. I had even talked to my teammates, Allie Raisman and Michaela Maroney, about the treatment and how uncomfortable it made us feel. None of us could quite understand it. After I made the Olympic team, I suffered a stress fracture in my right shin. It was extremely painful to tumble and land with my legs, but I fought through the pain because it was the Olympics, and I knew it would be my only shot. Our bodies were all hanging by a thread in London. And who was the doctor that USAG sent with us to keep us healthy and help us get through? The doctor that was our abuser and a child molester. To this day, I still don't know how he could have been allowed to do this for so long. We, we now know he abused my sister survivor and fellow Olympian, Jamie Dancher, 20 years ago. Women at Michigan State University reported his abuse even earlier, and they were silenced and ignored. If these institutions had done their job, neither of us would be sitting here today. My teammates and I were subjected to his medical care every single month at the Caroli Ranch in Texas. He was the only male allowed to be present in the athlete dorm rooms to do whatever treatments he wanted. He was allowed to treat us in our hotel rooms alone and without any supervision. He took photos of us during training and whenever else he wanted to. Nobody was protecting us from being taken advantage of. No one was even concerned whether or not we were being sexually abused. Me and my teammates were not protected. My parents trusted USA Gymnastics and Larry Nassar to take care of me, and we were betrayed by both. And now, the lack of accountability from USAG, USOC, and Michigan State have caused me and many other girls to remain shameful, confused, and disappointed. I'm an Olympian. Despite being abused, I worked so hard and was able to achieve my goal. But I want everyone to know that I'm one of over 250 women and survivors whose story is just as important. Our pain is all the same, and our stories are all important. The people and organizations who are responsible need to accept responsibility for the pain they've caused me and my sister survivors. Larry Nassar has received his punishment, and he'll never see the outside of a prison cell again. Now it's up to Congress to hold those people and, and institutions accountable who enabled Larry Nassar and attempted to cover up his terrible crimes. USA Gymnastics, the US Olympic Committee, and MSU must all be held accountable. My teammates and sister survivors have been through too much. No one should ever have to endure physical, emotional, or sexual abuse for the privilege of representing our country as athletes. Now it's time for change, because the current and future athletes don't deserve to live in anxiety, fear, or be unprotected like we were. Thank you. Ms. Farrell. Uh, thank you for the inv invitation to testify today, and thank you to everyone in the room for being here. As a survivor of childhood sexual abuse during my competitive years as a speed skater, I am here to speak truth to the negligence and at times exploitation of children, as well as to discuss ideas to create safer sport environments for current and future children through balanced, purposeful, and effective policy to the best of my ability. My name is Bridie Farrell. I earned a BS from Cornell University in policy analysis and management. I'm co-founder and CEO of New York Loves Kids, and I currently live in Brooklyn, New York. In 1998-89, my parents enrolled my brother Patrick and I in speed skating with the Saratoga Winter Club. I was six years old, smiling, and loving everything about racing fast. Ironically, my reasons for being here today began around the same time. By April 1990, Northern Michigan University's Human Resources Department and Public Safety Department, the United States Olympic Committee via the United States Olympic Education Center, members of the United States speed skating team, and members of USA Boxing knew the sexual misconduct of resident athlete, coach, and employee at Northern Michigan University, Andy Gable. Documents obtained by a FOIA request that are attached to the testimony that I handed in reveal both the inadequate investigation and a very successful cover-up. An individual within boxing community witnessed a 14-year-old female, we'll call Jane Doe, 
entering and exiting Andy Gable's room at Mayland Hall at Northern Michigan University on numerous occasions. Andy Gable was about 24 or 25 at the time. The botched investigation has no record of interviewing Jane Doe nor interviewing Andy Gable, who are the people of concern of the investigation. There is also no documentation of contacting the parents of Jane Doe. Numerous adults, all men, were made aware of criminal situation and no one alerted the parents of a 14-year-old child. I will highlight a few sections of the official reports now as well as um, included in my testimony. Exhibit A. We also, this is a quote from the, test, uh, the report. We also felt that it was needed to be aware of both parties' rights in this matter, written by the leading investigator on the case, which one, shows the severity of the claims and acknowledges the rights of both parties. However, the municipality police department was never contacted. Thus, they did not take seriously the situation that they acknowledge, and second, Acknowledging the rights of both parties, Jane Doe was never inter interviewed or contacted, again, nor her parents. It certainly reads that the parties deserving equal rights are the institution and the male abuser. The next excerpt states that Mr. Lubbs, who's an adult within USA Boxing, sees Jane Doe leaving Andy Gable's room late at night in sleeping clothes with a blanket and crying. Andy Gable's explanation of the incident is that he had just informed Jane Doe they are ending seeing each other. Basic logic backs this up only one step to realize that they were seeing each other. He was 24 or 25 and she was 14. A conversation between speed skater Charles King and Mr. Moore, who was involved with the investigation, document more inappropriate, documents more inappropriate and illegal sexual relationship by Gable. King allegedly told Mr. Moore on January of 1990 that Gable and Jane Doe went into their room while King was there, that they were in bed together and that it was obvious that they had sex. And then the conclusion of the report reads, due to the fact that none of the allegations concerning sexual relations between Gable and Jane Doe could be substantiated, there is no further action uh, to take by this department. Signed, Victor J. LaDuke, investigator, Northern Michigan University Public Safety. And this is where the story of Andy Gable in sports should end. Let me confirm what you're already afraid to hear and that his career did not end here. Andy Gable went on competing through 1998. He then became involved with the Salt Lake Olympic Committee, the president of USA Speed Skating while I was still an athlete, and finally chairman of the ISU when he finally resigned in 2013. The sexual predator remained in speed skating for over 30 years after his behavior was identified. My story is on February 28, 2013, I confidently sat in the Lake Effect recording studio in Milwaukee, Wisconsin with Mitch Tyke to record my first disclosure on child sexual abuse at the hands and ego of Andy Gable. I was sexually abused at 15 by a 33-year-old teammate in his house in Saratoga Springs. I was molested on a blanket he laid out at the Saratoga National Battlefield. I was molested in Saratoga Springs Spa State Park. I was molested in ice rinks. I was molested in the restaurant parking lots. I was sexually abused on the grounds of the United States Olympic Training Center in Lake Placid, New York. I was sexually abused in my high school parking lot. I was sexually abused in the back hallway of my parents' house. I was molested in the driveway after early ice training before the sun had even come up. The man who molested me perfected the deceitful art of grooming. He established trust with my family. He saw my father for his doctor. He sought out piano lessons from my mom, and he drove me to and from training, always saying hello to my siblings and parents with a smile. He used his college degree to further con my parents of his positive role in my very impressionable life. I briefly want to touch on the impact of all this. At 15, I was disposable meat of a known 33-year-old child sexual predator. When he had torn apart all he wanted, he left my picked over adolescent carcass to decay and rot. My body hurt. It hurt so badly. I screamed, sometimes out loud, sometimes in writing, sometimes into a bottle, and frequently into overtraining. I was about 20 years old when I asked a friend that should I die unexpectedly to rush to my parents' home and recover my journals. Even a hypothetical death, I was too ashamed to let my parents know I was sexually abused under their purview. Bouts of depression came and lowered, but never left. And ultimately, I retired from speed skating in December 2005. The first time I remember audibly screaming that I wanted to die was in 2006. 
I was done skating, I was trying to move on from the nightmare, and however, the pain inside me only grew. Over my flip phone, I screamed to my mother, I want to die, I was in pain. After graduating from Cornell, I moved to Harlem. Countless mornings, I wanted to jump in front of the oncoming Metro North train. 10 years, marked 10 years after the child, the physical part of the child's sexual abuse ended, I actively still needed to kill the pain. After only one year of living in my Harlan apartment, I had to move because the huge window taunted me to jump. It wasn't the lure of jumping, but the knowledge of falling only three stories down to the sidewalk would not end my pain. I had to move. In 2012, I reached a bottom. My mom sat next to me, and as I sobbed in pain, she begged me to tell her how she could help. I was in a chair, and she sat near my feet, her head's on my knees and asked, I finally asked for her what I wanted, and I asked my own mother to kill me. In 2013, I returned to speed skating after a seven-year hiatus. I met Claire, a young, fearless girl who was the reason I knew to tell my story, and I knew telling the truth would be the right thing to do. I knew the insulting New York State laws only opened up me to legal repercussions. I had been through so much pain, I was still decaying in pain. I decided I would sacrifice for Claire and all the future Claires. I went public as a survivor of child sexual abuse by known, respected, and honored Andy Gable. I have grown to be a strong and brave woman, not because of the sexual abuse that I endured, but despite the abuse. Do you think I am brave? Many praise my bravery, our bravery. Bravery for retelling our stories, bravery in telling the truth. Please take pause. What do you acknowledge as being brave? Standing up against the man who sexually abused me 20 years ago is brave. Then please recognize the hypocrisy of expecting a child athlete to report sexual abuse while it is still happening. Many children, for many children, it is impossible to disclose molestation or rape because children do not have the vocabulary, which was just said a minute ago. I did not learn that being molested, I did not learn that being molested by a 33-year-old man was a crime until I was at Cornell and I was 27 years old. Over 80% of child sexual pe uh, perpetrators know their victim, the child. On average, survivors of child sexual abuse do not disclose until their 40s. One in six boys are victims of child sexual abuse by their 18th birthday. One in four girls are victims of child sexual abuse by their 18th birthday. I have three sisters and two brothers, so I am the statistic of one in four. Can I keep going or should I stop? Okay. I told my story on February 28th, 2013. Within days, Andy Gable released a statement in the Chicago Tribune acknowledging the sexual inappropriate relationship that he had. Then came a following statement from Scott Blackman. In sport, as in life, we have a duty to everything we can do to protect children from abuse at the hands of adults, said USOC Chief Executive Scott Blackman. We are glad that Ms. Farrell chose to tell her story because it makes others who have been abused aware that they are not alone and hopefully shine a light on the resources that are available to administrators, coaches, parents, and athletes to help protect our young athletes. However, when I met with Scott Blackman in, 2013, in 2013, the then CEO of the USOC, specifically asked that I direct athletes to report to him and not to the media. The USOC would not look into taking Andy Gable from USA, Andy Gable's USA Speed Skating membership, nor would they look into taking him out of the Hall of Fame. The USOC would not look into preventing Andy Gable from coaching, not even within speed skating. Mr. Blackman only advised I return home to my state of New York and deal with the situation. Mr. Blackman made it, made it crystal clear. There was nothing he nor the USOC could do for me, stating that the USOC did not have such juris jurisdiction over the national governing bodies. However, in the midst of the USA gymnastics shakedown, the USOC acknowledged the NGB could de be decertified and overtaken by the head organization. It certainly seems that the USOC wants to pick and choose when to be involved, and it only seems to want to be involved when it favors the USOC. I have spent a large part of the last three to four years working to reform the statute of limitations in New York for child sexual abuse in a bill called the Child Victims Act. This was the impetus for me to, to launch my organization, New York Loves Kids. This time in the political arena has illustrated the, near, the need to not just hear both sides of the story, but all sides of the story. 
And I've also learned the important issues are the ones discussed in hearings. Again, I would like to thank you for sincerely pondering how best to make sports safer. The majority of my work is on the state level, but I do have three concrete suggestions. First, there really, really, really needs to be a higher percentage of athletes that are required on the national governing body boards. In my opinion, something closer to 50% of athlete voices ought to be heard. Much like I am here today, based on my experience of child sexual abuse, someone with actual speed skating experience should be at the table discussing how the organization moves forward. Following suggestion one, the definition of an athlete ought to be expanded. Even with my competitive experience, I'm aged out of being able to run for a position that must be held by an athlete. An older athlete doesn't forget too quickly the sacrifices being made as an athlete. Also, an older individual will bring additional real-world life experience to a position, which is a valuable attribute. And finally, there is the disclosure of sexual abuse. The police have to be notified. How are we still living in an age of Fox guarding the hen house? In my opinion, I find it to be risky business for the United States Olympic Committee to dabble in adjudicating claims of sexual assault, sexual abuse, or rape. Rather than trying to protect the image of the organization or try to maintain sponsors, I believe the USOC should lobby for states to resurrect archaic statutes of limitations on child sexual abuse laws from Alabama to Wisconsin, from Oregon to New York. Um, I just want to make one more uh, comment and it's a question about if uh, the USOC is any better now that Scott Blackman has stepped down. And I just want to point out that a postal worker in Colorado Springs was found with a sack of undelivered letters, and he is facing up to five years in prison, and he's fined $250,000. Scott Blackman knew that Larry Nasser was a monster, yet Scott Blackman still fed young girls in leotards through a door, knowing full well there was a hungry lion on the other side. Over 250 women have come forward. People have died. Families have been torn apart. Lives have been largely ruined. Hundreds of women have PTSD, depression, anxiety, and trust challenges, just to name a few. The CEO that looks the other way or strategically wears earmuffs is just as much a kingpin in this game as the one committing the crime. Institutions need to be held accountable. Survivors need to be acknowledged. Without policy reform, the unjust muzzle will remain bound on children while safeguarding the pedophiles to roam free. So long as the abuse of power continues, the horror in gyms and dojos and fields and courts and pools and tracks and mountains and ice rinks will not end. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Morizi. Thank you for hearing me speak today. One of the saddest things you will hear in almost every case where a child was abused by an authority figure in Olympic sports is the number of years it took for any action to occur. In my case, the abuse began nearly 40 years ago when I was 13. I reported it to my sports governing body, the United States Figure Skating Association, nearly 20 years ago and my abuser was suspended from coaching less than two months ago. My story is a case history of the power of abusers and organizations to silence powerless child victims of sexual abuse in the relentless pursuit of money and medals. Like many of these stories do, it began with a child chasing an Olympic dream. I was 13 years old and beginning to skate competitively in figure skating. I was thrilled to start working with Richard Callahan, who was the area's top coach and later became one of the most successful coaches of world and Olympic champions. Richard took an immediate liking to me, spending hours in his office listening to me talk about my hopes, dreams, and challenges and offering the advice of an older mentor. Years later, I realized this was part of a grooming process that resulted in sexual abuse that began when I was 15 and lasted into my early 20s. During that time, we achieved considerable professional success. As a skater, I was a member of Team USA. Together, we coached some of the most prominent figures in our sport, including gold medalist Tara Lipinski. Like many survivors of child sexual abuse, I had a deep personal connection and an undying loyalty to my abuser. It took years of soul searching and self-loathing, plus the support of my wife and family, before I fully recognized what he had done 
and mustered the courage to come forward and report it. When I did, I was treated with the same disdain, disrespect, and disbelief by the U.S. Figure Skating Association as many of the Larry Nassar victims who tried to report him to USA Gymnastics or Michigan State University. My character and motives were attacked on the pages of the New York Times by my abuser. Several other skaters came forward to publicly report allegations of sexual misconduct by Callahan. The U.S. Figure Skating Association took no action against him, claiming that I had waited too long to report him. The rule at the time was I had a maximum of 60 days to report. They refused to even conduct an investigation, and he was allowed to continue coaching. I went on with my life and said nothing for 20 more years. In January of this year, something extraordinary happened. Hundreds of brave young women got up publicly in Michigan courtrooms and gave heart-wrenching testimony of the abuse they suffered at the hands of an Olympic team doctor. Olympic medalists, including da Jamie Dancher and Jordan Weber, revealed a pattern of disbelief and disrespect by their Olympic governing body, USA Gymnastics, that was so similar to what I had experienced from U.S. figure skating that it made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. These brave women <clears throat> gave me the courage to speak out again, and I want to publicly thank them for it today. I contacted the U.S. Center for Safe Sport two months ago. They promptly opened an investigation and suspended Richard Callahan from coaching. It is my hope that he will be banned for life. The U.S. Olympic Committee and its governing bodies are chartered by our federal government, and this committee has oversight authority. I respectfully ask you to find out why the USOC did nothing for decades while reports of child sexual abuse in many Olympic sports were ignored. Who is responsible for this tragedy, and how will they be held accountable? I love my sport and the Olympic movement. I still coach kids that have the Olympic dream, some of whom achieve it. Every child in every sport needs to know that the adults in charge have a duty to keep them safe. If they see or experience abuse, they must be assured that they will be believed and we will take action. The Olympic Creed teaches us the important thing in the Olympic Games is not to win, but to take part as the most important thing in life is not the triumph, but the struggle. No child should ever have to sacrifice his or her innocence as part of their struggle to represent our nation in the Olympics. Thank you for your leadership and concern. Thank you and thank all, all of our witnesses so much for your testimony. Um, uh, first of all, let me respond by saying, uh, I just, uh, I, I indicated to this when I visited with it, a few of the Olympians uh, several weeks ago, I just don't understand, I don't know people who don't respond to the plea of a child for help. Uh, whether you know that person or not, whether you have a responsibility, a legal or other responsibility, it, uh, I don't know in my lifetime experiences how when one hears the stories that you have told at ages in which we all have a responsibility to you that there is not a response of help a police report, uh, a, per a person of authority who responds to make sure that an individual is safe. And uh, it, uh, I don't know how we'd legislate that, but I want to certainly make the effort to make certain that no one's plea for help goes unanswered by the person that they make their point to, the person they make their case to. And so uh, I want to explore what needs to happen uh, going forward. First, let me try to understand what the circumstances are. So we have uh, three sports represented here, uh, figure skating, speed skating, and gymnastics. Um, in light of the statements that you've made over time, what's your, I assume people will have contacted you, will have told you what uh, they've experienced. So explain to the subcommittee, if you can, how much broader this is. Let me, let me ask the question in a, in a less um, a biased way. Does the problem, do the problems that you describe extend beyond 
the sports that you participated in uh, within um, amateur sports? Uh. Sure, I can start by answering that. I wish the answer was no, but uh, clearly it goes across all sports, summer, winter. Um, I was in Colorado Springs a few years ago just visiting a friend and I saw some athletes returning from a competition and they were um, Taekwondo athletes, so they had their helmets and their guard on, so I knew who they were. Um, Taekwondo is a sport that is plagued with horrific sexual abuse. And I went up to these athletes and I said to them, hey, if you guys ever need anything and you need to talk to somebody outside of your sport, you can call me. My name's Bridie Farrell. And they all were just like, yeah, we know who you are, okay. Right, so like, I never met these people. I had no idea who they were. But in the sports where it's known about the problem and the people that are, have been identified and are repeatedly reported and nothing is done against them, um, I was able to reach out in that capacity and someone related. So um, on a very tangible way, that's, that's one example I would say. Are there no examples of where when an athlete reported um, sexual misconduct that the process, the system worked to protect that athlete? They don't, those examples don't exist? I've never heard of it. I can answer that. I, I, and I would have to say that, that, that in, in some instances, it, it, it has worked, in all fairness. I, I, was, uh, I met with uh, two executives from U.S. figure skating uh, at the Olympics in uh, South Korea regarding my particular situation. Um, I, was, I was informed uh, for the first time since 1999 when I, when I uh, gave my first uh, report, if you will, that as a result of my, uh, my uh, grievance, we called it, even though mine wasn't even heard, uh, that, that things were put into place uh, to begin the process of stopping this. And uh, as early as one year after uh, I gave my uh, testimony was denied, there was a first uh, perpetrator that was that was caught and suspended from from U.S. Figure Skating, and so so there there like you know, it, it there 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 has been steps at least in my sport taken to try to uh, uh, address this issue. Uh, you in particular have utilized safe sport, and uh, is it making the difference today that we would want to see? Yes and no. The, 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 reason, the reason I say that is, is yes, in, res, in respect to the fact that, that my allegations were given credence, and it was the first time uh, in 20 years. I, I had just assumed that it was just going to, this is the way it was, and I'm just going to go on with my life. I had, you know, I, I had to make a choice uh, because I still work in the, in the business. Uh, and so I was, I was heartened by the, by the way, the, the seriousness that they took my allegation. They, they, were, they were very uh, supportive, and, uh, and, uh, and for that, it's, uh, I'm grateful. However, my, my fiance asked a very uh, important question of them while I was, while I was being interviewed, and, sh and, her, and her question was, what happens after this situation uh, ends. Let, let's let's say uh, the, you know you find him uh, guilty. Does he go to jail? Does he does he serve any type of uh, uh, penalty beyond not being able to coach on the sport? And the answer is no. And, and, and that that in fact he that that's really about it. And then I made a point to to the uh, to. The, the people there and, and uh, other people who have asked the question, is that I, I, my role right now is director of figure skating in a rink in New Jersey. So I'm, I'm in charge of, of hiring and, and firing coaches. If I wanted to today, I could hire this man to teach at my rink. 
essentially, all that, all that uh, a ban from, at least in my sport, a ban from U.S. figure skating means is, is that, the, that Richard Callan can't attend U.S. figure skating sanctioned competitions. But what he does on a day-to-day -day basis, that we have, the U.S. figure skating has no jurisdiction. And so, as, as shocking as that is, just because he's banned doesn't do, has, doesn't have enough teeth, in my opinion. And, and, uh, and one of the reasons I, I, I'm, I'm here today is, is to put that forth to you and, and, and hopefully somebody can figure out a way how more teeth can be put into the, uh, these, these situations and, and not allow him near children. The one aspect of the safe sport, which I think is important to recognize, so safe sport is a byproduct of the U.S. Olympic Committee wanted that to happen. And they're supposed to investigate and look into any sort of allegations that someone makes, right? So again, let's go back to Taekwondo, where there was these allegations against the number one athlete. And they are very, very concrete act, uh, evidence. However, this, on the side of the safe sport, they have to be pretty, pretty sure that these things actually happened or else safe sport, USOC, is going to be sued for, for, you know, taking action against this athlete. Well, the penalty would have been that he would not have been able to compete in the world championships, which would be a big bummer for him, right? Like, it's the biggest competition in the year. Everybody wants to compete at Worlds, but it's much bigger than that. Because how that athlete does at Worlds can impact how many they're allowed to have, say, where they start in the World Cup next season, or um, how many, if it's a year before the Olympics, it might impact how many judo players are allowed to compete for Team USA, right? So it's not just like it's a penalty against that one individual, it's a penalty against potentially much more in the sport. And quite honestly, in many sports, I would say the three at this table, like, they do happen more than every four years, right? And so the funding is low. And so without earning medals, you don't get the funding that you need. And if you only have one good athlete, you got to be really sure that this guy is wrong before you bench him and don't let him go to the world championships. So having safe sport as your disciplinary board, although they say are separate, you have to realize the implications of taking action against one athlete. The trickle effect is much more, if that makes sense. Uh, thank you for answering my questions. I'll have more uh, later, but let me now turn to the ranking member. With your uh, permission, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to yield to Senator Hassan, who has a scheduling um, issue. and. I'll go ahead. Senator Hassan is recognized. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and for your courtesy, uh, Ranking Member Blumenthal. Uh, thank all of you for being here. To all of the witnesses, I am so profoundly grateful for your leadership and your courage in revisiting some of the most painful moments of your life, all in order to help prevent others from enduring what you guys have endured. You are world-class athletes, your heroes, and your survivors. And your bravery here today to share your stories deserves our gratitude and respect to be sure. But I just also want you to know what a change you are making for future generations of athletes as well as current athletes. And what a great example uh, you're standing up and speaking out is giving to so many other people who are going to also need to muster bravery and courage in their lives uh, for one reason or the next. Um, I just thought maybe each of you could take a minute to address two questions I have, which will likely take the rest of the time I have for, for questions. Given your experiences, I'd like to hear if you can identify this, who you believe to be most responsible for allowing these abuses to continue, and also, what cultural factors in your training fostered an atmosphere in which these abuses could begin and continue for so long? And maybe, Mr. Maurizi, I could start with you. Who would I, who would I hold accountable? Who do you uh, think is the most, I mean? I, I, two, two answers come to my, to my mind. First, first and foremost, when I, when I decided to uh, file a grievance, I my, I, I hired an attorney, 
and my, to, to, to guide me through this. My attorney's first advice was to contact the local authorities yeah. and to report a, a crime. The, the statute of limitations had run way past. By the time I uh, reported the crime, I was 36 years old. I believe at the time uh, in Michigan where I was uh, living, the, the statute was 26. I was also in New York, and the, yeah. the, 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 the 26 was as old as I could be. I couldn't have fathomed uh, uh, of even dealing with that until much later, to be honest with you. So that was one thing. Yeah. Second thing are the, the various rinks that, uh, at, or, and, and figure skating clubs that I was uh, a member of and participated in. My, my coach, I, I learned later, had traveled, had a move from club to club to club because uh, allegations surfaced about his uh, treatment of his athletes. But none of them shared with other rinks. They did. Oh, they did. They did share with other rinks. They shared, they shared the rumors okay. that they heard. But uh, difficult to, to, to prosecute somebody on rumors, I guess. Okay. Uh, so, that, so everybody uh, was, uh, knew about it. For example, when, when, uh, when Richard moved to the, Detroit, to the Detroit Skating Club, a former student of mine told me that she was told by the uh, officials there that he wasn't allowed inside the men's locker room. Okay. That, uh, uh, but, but he still was hired. Let me, I, I don't, I don't want to interrupt any of you, but we have limited time, so I'm just wondering, if Ms. Farrell and then Ms. Weaver and Andrew, you can take a stab each at this. Yeah, so in terms of who, yeah. I would say it really goes back to the men that are listed in the, um, the report that was given out. Um, they knew about it. There was the same thing with uh, the man that repeatedly molested me. He was known to be this person, but there was actually a report. Okay. And it was swept under the rug. Um, and the, the culture that has to change, it's, um, it's the idea that we are so brave to be here is a, it solidifies what the problem is. That is what shows like how hard it is. Right. And then you're expecting a kid to come forward and say things that they do not know the words that exist right. for, right? Yep. So it's a culture, it's just a, a, a cultural issue and it's the idea that people are finally speaking up and even look at like Time Magazine, people are finally listen, speaking up. Like honestly, that's not true. We've been yelling and no one's been listening. Okay. So I would say the ears of all the adults out there. Thank you. Um, Ms. Weber. Yeah. So when I think about who's most accountable, obviously, as I said, USA Gymnastics, USOC, Michigan State. But if you look a little bit deeper than that, um, I think it all started when the Carolis, um, the who, you know. Yeah brought USA Gymnastics to where it is now, when they came over from Romania, they brought a lot of those training styles over and um, a lot of the abusive training styles. And I think that USA Gymnastics started to see that it was winning medals and they were getting lots of money. And then as a result, I think that that training style kind of seeped into the personal coaches um, across the nation. Yeah. And, and now that's the, that's the normal way of coaching. And you can ask any elite gymnast, they know exactly which coaches across country are the most abusive, but people will still send their athletes there or their kids there because they know they want to be successful and that's their best chance of making the Olympic team. So that's what they've made us believe, that that's, that's the only way you're going you're gonna to win medals and be successful is, is um, by having coaches that will beat you to the ground like that. Um, so I think... The, cult, the cultural issues go, you know, start, they start with the Carolis and in, in that training style. Thank you. And with the chair's indulgence, could we hear briefly from Ms. Dancher, too? Thank you. Uh, as far as the most accountable, I would obviously agree with uh, Jordan, since very similar to my experience. Um, and with regard to how people say this, that I'm so brave, and I... I appreciate what you say because I've, I've never felt brave. I felt like I was doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And so hearing Mr. Marisi's testimony made me cry because that's one of the reasons why I came forward was to give, to tell people it's okay to speak up. Yeah. And 
The other thing is, I guess, uh, the cultural problems in gymnastics are, there's so many, as, as she said. Um, uh, Larry Nassar saw the coach's abuse, uh, you know, almost on a daily basis, and he didn't report their abuse, and vice versa. Um, so they protected each other. And, you know, I, I obviously wanted to come forward because I was sexually abused. And so I wanted to do the right thing, and I wanted to protect others. And it shouldn't take having to have the experience yeah. to do the right thing. Because yeah. um, I, I wonder if it, you know, if this would have happened to anyone that was running USAG, any one of their daughters or their sons or any of their kids, you know, would they, would have they react differently, you know? Look, thank you all very, very much. And um, I look forward to reading and hearing some more of your testimony. Thank you again uh, to the chair and ranking member for your courtesy. Senator Blumenthal. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. Uh, let me ask you, uh, do you think this kind of abuse is still going on in gymnastics or skating? Yes. Um, I, I know for sure it's still going on. Uh, when you have the the organizing, you know, USA Gymnastics, the organizing governing body that's the leadership, and that's how they decided to lead, that's going to trickle down mm -hmm. and be a failed system completely. Um, a lot of people will say, you know, the the abuser, oh, not not Larry, he's so nice, you know, he's, he's so nice, and, you know, everyone, everyone liked him and trusted him, and it doesn't matter how nice they are. In fact, it's usually the nicest ones that's, that's how they groom. That's how they manipulate everybody. That's what they live for. And that doesn't mean that it should be okay for him to be in a room, in a room alone with children. It shouldn't matter how nice they are. And um, gymnastics also is a very hands-on sport. Uh, so we, we actually do need, you know, males and females that know how to spot and help, help us learn skills when we're younger. Um, but I definitely think there needs to be policies that change, like how, how they put our hands on us and when, and uh, there's something called body shaping that's just so normal. There was times Larry was touching me over my leotard and in, in the middle of the gym in Texas at the training center and everyone was there and no one thought anything of it because it seemed normal in gymnastics and um, you know things like that need to be changed. I think the interesting thing as well is with USA Gymnastics, obviously the board of directors all resigned, but the people who um, are on the national team staff or in charge of the training camps every month, um, the ones who have the most interaction with the athletes, they're still there. It's the same people in charge. And, um, and I don't think that they're, they're innocent at all. I think that they've seen things and haven't said anything or they, they knew things at one point and didn't do the right thing. And um, I feel like there needs to be an entirely new staff in order for this to stop. Ms. Bright, how about in speed skating? To be honest, um, I think speed skating is pretty good on whole in this. I mean, I came forward and uh, women came forward after me, so but all for the same person. Um, I know of one person who was coaching and was accused of something, so USA Speed Skating quickly took him out of a coaching position and gave him the position as being an athlete. Doesn't really solve the problem, right? So I would say within speed skating, I mean, it's a very, very small sport and small community, and to the most of what I see that um, it, it, is, it is okay. And how about in figure skating? Uh, I, I, I'm Sure, that it's rampant is maybe a bit strong, but it, but I say it's very prevalent in the sport. Uh, coaches at the grassroots level, in the trenches, if you will, operate almost in complete autonomy. There, there is no, uh, there's, there's no mechanisms in place, with the exception of uh, if you go on a website and you read the things not to do. There's, there's no enforcement. I think that with without without any enforcement, people are able to uh, do as they please. What is shocking to me is not only that this kind of predatory abuse happened, but that it is ongoing. 
it's continuing, even after all of the shocking revelation, even after Larry Nassar has been sentenced to 175 years, even after some of the marginal changes that have been made in this sport, it continues, according to your testimony. If you were advising parents as to how to avoid this scourge, this continuing scourge for their children, what would you say to them? Uh, I think one of, the, one of the things I, I really want to do is um, go to, you know, different gyms around the country and talk to gym owners, parents, and, and, and the children and bring more education and awareness about the subject, number one. Um, I think in gymnastics that, you know, the parents um, are uh, like often encouraged not even to watch practice. They don't want them to be too involved. Uh, not to ask too many questions. And uh, when I was coaching, I always, that's, that's, their, that's their child. They're allowed to ask whatever question they want. Um, so I think just looking for those red flags, if they tell you not to you know, watch your kid train or you're not allowed to ask questions, um, I, don't, I don't think that's a good sign right there. But I would definitely tell them you know, to, to look for those things. And even if you trust this coach and he's the nicest person in the world, um, you know, don't, don't trust them too much. Don't let them ever be alone with them. Especially if they're offering favors or food or visits to their rooms. You've described, all of you have described, I think, a grooming process, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and I think um, my mom experienced some of the same things, even though I was the one abused, she was just as manipulated by somebody like Larry. And I think aside from Larry, there's so much intimidation that goes on between parents and coaches and parents and USA Gymnastics. And our parents were, were allowed to travel to our meets, but we weren't allowed to see them ever. And, and they're just basically told not to ask any questions, not to argue, because obviously they want the best for their children. They want us to be successful and they feel like they should be able to tr trust these organizations, but clearly, they couldn't. So I think there's just so many different levels of intimidation going on. Um, and I think especially for our parents. And right now, I don't feel confident that, that our parents should be able to trust the governing bodies. For me, this is a really tricky question because I, I still love speed skating and sports and everything. I'd put my kids in speed skating. I still think it's great. I think that the majority of athletes and coaches are wonderful people and are not child molesters, but every child molester would love to be a coach, right? So that's a really, really disturbing sentence. Um, but I think it's also important to recognize that the majority of child sexual abuse is from people within the home and people we know. It's more within families than um, like coming from the sports community. And so I think that it's really important to not bounce too far. And for kids that are being sexually abused at home, that 30 minutes they have with that coach might be the only 30 minutes they can pretend that they actually have a dad, right? So there's two sides to it. Um, in speed skating, it's a very technical sport. So you have blades that are bent to only go left. They're offset on your foot and they're rocked. They're not actually flat depending on the ice surface and the humidity in the rink, like all these things will change. Um, and so you'll, re, you'll change your skates, your blades, and you'll go to your, co I would always go to my coach's room and do this. And there was never an issue with him. And I can list out thousands of people that were so helpful to my speed skating career. And then I can list out a few that were very, very problematic. So I think that the idea of kids being able to tell their parents is one thing for sure. Um, I mean, I've told my parents many times and I'm not sure it's set in yet. So I think kids really need to somehow develop a relationship externally where they're, you know, like an aunt or an uncle that they can tell these things to because parents don't want to hear it as much as the governing bodies don't want to hear it as much as no one wants to hear it, right? So. Um, like what I went through was really, really awful, but the 
competing and the camaraderie and all of that was also quite amazing. And so I think it's important just to keep that in mind as well. I've been coaching now for almost 30 years, and and I, I could I can tell you many war stories that the coaches talk about uh, amongst each other about the horrible parents that we've had to deal with. That that, that they they you know they, they infiltrate this. They talk about that. They they talk in the lobby. We call it lobby talk, where that influences uh, their ability to make money uh, because uh, maybe they want to switch coaches or something like this. Um, and so. Uh, a lot of coaches don't like the parents to to be in the rink to watch. They they even have talks with them about not being in the rink and uh, so they can do their work uh, and not overanalyze. Uh, I was one of those people for for a long, long time because I was you know young and uh, I thought it was going to change the world. And uh, but but I've I've made a big big uh, about face, if you will, and. Uh, I find it very easy to be able to, to treat an athlete the correct way, even if the parents are watching. Uh, I, 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 I feel it's not difficult to allow the parents into the room to, if you're going to change the blade or, or, or you do, do it in a, in a, public, in a public place. I remember talking to, to, to somebody who's about how things are done in figure skating and, and he, his jaw dropped. He says, you do what? You do what? If you take one step back and you apply common sense to, to interpersonal relationships, it's really not that difficult to, to do things, we'll call it the right way. We, we have subcultures inside of our own sports which, uh, of ways that we've done things for years and years and years that for us is completely normal. But if, if I told you about them, you'd be shocked. Uh, one of them being the, the going into the hotel room. If, 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 and for us, this is normal. We, we, it's no big deal. But, but I'm sure there's got to be a couple people in this room that say, what, a young teenage girl w walks into the adult male's hotel room and, and it's fine? Uh, th 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 that, that, for me, is, the, is the, um, the, the, something to, to think about. Let me thank you all. Uh, I've gone way over my time, and I uh, apologize to the chairman. But uh, you know, we can't eradicate all the evils in the world. And a lot of people come to us and say, "Well, we made a mistake. We need to do better." But there are clearly systematic failings here in the United States Olympic Committee that need to be addressed, not just with kind of admonitions, but major structural reforms. And you said. Um, I think it was uh, Ms. Bridie Farrell, or one of you, that we have responsibility because it's on us, the United States Congress, which has oversight authority over the United States Olympic Committee. And so your stories and your admonitions and your testimony that this scourge is continuing are a mandate to us that we need to take steps to crack down. Thank you. Can I mention one more thing? Yes, ma'am. Is that off? Um, I think something else to consider when looking at there's so many different sports is that, for example, speed skating is very different in that men and women train together, and you can be good when you're young and good when you're old. So I was good when I was 15, and then I took seven years off, and I was good when I was 32. And men and women train, uh, train on the same sheet of ice. I mean, you're not going to see that if the equipment's at different levels or that kind of thing. So then you're gonna have men and women sharing locker rooms and the things that we would do and change, everyone would be like, that's just weird, but it's always been that way kind of thing. So I think when you guys go back and are thinking about it, there's just so many different dynamics. If you just think locker room and you just think men in a locker room, um, there's just so much more to it through each of the different sports. Ms. Cortez Mass. Thank you. First of all, let, let me just say thank you to the chairman um, for holding this hearing today. I know Senator Lee and I and a number of committee members had requested this, so appreciate uh, the conversation today. And then, uh, like my colleagues, I want to echo thank you all for being here. Um, your voices uh, will make that change, will make a difference uh, and, and help others. Um, and that's one of the things I want to talk about. You know, I've spent, prior to coming to the Senate, um, gosh, 10 years as a prosecutor working to protect children from sexual predators. Uh, what I have seen and heard here today 
uh, unfortunately, um, is a system failure that has allowed these predators to thrive. And you've talked about it. The grooming that occurs, um, the keeping the parents out. Uh, and one issue that I want to talk specifically about, because I only have about five minutes, is this notion that of, of children, sometimes there's this thought they should be asking for help. But when you're a child and you don't know any different, this becomes your norm. So you don't know that you need to ask for help. And when you do figure that out, is there somebody that you can reach out to for help? That's what I see happening here. And so what I would love from uh, the four of you, your thoughts, um, what I have found is sometimes it helps to have an advocate, somebody who is there with the athlete, somebody that um, the, particularly our child athletes become familiar with knowing that it's somebody that is going to advocate on their behalf for everything that you've just talked about. Do you think if we were looking at implementing and working with the USOC that we w looked at having child advocates amongst the system, that that would be helpful and that would have um, helped you and or will help other children uh, that are coming through um, the amateur sports to help them address their needs? And let me just open it up to all, all of you. I'll start. I absolutely think that's necessary. Um, with USA Gymnastics, we had, um, what do they call it? Athlete. An athlete representative who was also on the selection committee. So she was supposed to be our advocate, but she was also the one deciding whether we made the team or whether we would you know, go compete for Team USA. So even if she, was, she would be there to advocate for us, we didn't want to tell her anything because we were scared it's going to ruin our chances, which right. we know it probably would have. Um, so I feel very strongly that that has to be somebody who's, who doesn't, He's not on the selection committee who is totally on the athlete's side, and that's their main role is making sure that we can trust them and they'll, they'll stand up for us. And maybe even because I had a similar experience um, with my athlete rep, uh, not that I don't think she was on the selection committee at the time, but uh, we definitely couldn't trust her. Everything we told her, she would just run back and tell them, and we would just get in more trouble. Um, so maybe it, maybe an athlete rep could be somebody from a different sport, because um, I do think it is it is a good idea, but somebody that's not so close, because it seems like um, in our experience, if they're working for them, they're working with them. Right. Um, but I did I did want to mention this might be a little off your question, but real quickly, um, one of the other issues I found. So I was, I was working with um, an, another coach. I was coaching with him, and I started seeing things that I wanted to be in denial about. And um, I saw that he was touching the kids inappropriately when he was spotting. And I, I didn't know what to do. And when I finally decided to report it to the police, I wanted to be anonymous. Um, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't allow me to be anonymous. And they wanted to interview the children. And I was like, that's not going to work. These, the, some of these kids are five, and like it's like five to 16 years old, and they don't even know, they're not even aware that they're being abused right now. Um, and so I just, I wanted to bring that up because I think that's another avenue to look into is, is how, when it is reported, how does the investigate go down? Because, you know, these, these are highly skilled manipulators, mm -hmm. and, you know, this one particular had a family, and it's like it's his word against theirs. And if you can't prove it, you know it destroys a, a lot of lives. And that's that's just something I wanted to point out because I um, I couldn't go through with the full report because because of that. Thank you. No, and I agree. And I think um, and just from my experience, I know uh, many uh, law enforcement agencies have specific units that just focus on on um, child sexual abuse so that the investigators and the prosecutors know how to talk and, and, and relate and do that type of investigation, but not all have the resources to do so. But I agree that is part of the, the issue here that I have seen is this willingness to come forward, but at the same time, law enforcement needs enough information so that they can uh, take action it, because once you go to law enforcement, it's a criminal action. So they have to be able to investigate it from a criminal perspective, and that means going through 
uh, all of those hoops. So I, there, is, there is a disconnect, and we've got to figure out how, how we connect that. You're absolutely right. Um, uh, let me ask you this on, on the, um, uh, another question very quickly, because I'm actually, I'm out of time. I just realized that. So um, I have other questions to follow up on, but I, I will submit those for the record. But let me just say this. Thank you uh, again. Uh, I look forward to the opportunity to work with you. Uh, I am committed to making change. Um, however we can, systemic change. Uh, and I am looking forward to the USOC coming here, uh, along with the national governing bodies and uh, folks from Michigan. Uh, they should be at the table here, and they should be answering our questions. Uh, so thank you again uh, for being here. Senator Klobuchar. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to all of you. I think I've seen you, Ms. Weaver, before, um, um, and have worked through the Judiciary Committee and was a uh, sponsor of the bill uh, that Senator Feinstein Grassley and we introduced um, to prevent these types of tragedies from occurring in the future. I'm also the co-chair of the Olympic Caucus um, and won our Olympics um, to be a wonderful place uh, for uh, girls and young people. A little side note, we're proud of the women's hockey team and Minnesotans role in that. Uh, but your story um, makes it all not something to be proud of, and we want that to change. And so if you didn't come forward, um, I don't think we would be where we are. And I want to thank all of you for your courage in coming forward. OK, so um, Ms. Farrell, in your testimony, you emphasized that uh, reporting these crimes to local law enforcement must be a routine step. Oftentimes what we see in these is there's no encouragement to go to local law enforcement. I'm a former prosecutor um, like Senator Cortez Masto, and I know how important that is if you're going to make this work. Uh, the Protecting Young Victims from Sexual Abuse Act expands mandatory recording requirements to include adults affiliated with USA Gymnastics or similar organizations. Um, Ms. Farrell, how can we ensure reporting requirements are well understood and universally practiced so people know what they're supposed to do? I think that after the wake of USA Gymnastics that people across the country are wondering what to do and um, what to do with their kids in sports and everything like that. So I think it's a beautiful time to um, work on this legislation and then have a PSA and, and let people know that um, we've gone to our authorities in years past and it never went to the police, mm -hmm. but say, let people know that this is what should be expected as well as um, there should be some sort of, clearly some sort of repercussion if that doesn't happen. Um, I mean, and I that's don't. That's part of why the crimes went unreported for so long. Right, and they, they just wanted to tick out the statute of limitation clock, and then they're off the hook. But, I mean, how do you make people actually do that? I think you have to change the incentive structure, and as long as, you know, the insurance companies are paid this amount for sex abuse, and they know that statute of limitations is this long, and people don't report, then they hedge those bets. But as soon as you can change the incentive, which, it seems in this country is the only way is with the dollar, right? Mm -hmm. So I think until there is something that's going to force these governing bodies to change their behavior, I don't know how else to get them to change. Does anyone else want to talk about why it's difficult for people or was difficult for them to come forward and this went on so long because of that, besides the not telling you you should go to law enforcement? Ms. Weaver? Yeah. Um, I will just, I've already mentioned some things about this, but um, I think with gymnastics, there's this culture of silence. And mm -hmm. not only are we f afraid that if we speak out, it's going to ruin our chances of reaching our goal. I mean, the window of opportunity for gymnasts is so small with just the nature of our sport and our age and everything. Um, but also, I think it starts when we're, I mean, I started gymnastics at four years old, and you know, by the time I was seven, if I was late to practice, I had to climb the rope. Like, there's a rope that goes from the floor to the ceiling. So, just right from the beginning, just this culture of cult. fear, uh -huh. and just you know, if you don't do something, there's always a punishment. There's always like, I mean, even when we were injured, we were scared to tell our coaches. Like, I was terrified if my ankle started hurting to tell right. my coach because I knew he would be mad at me, and then, and then I had to go see the doctor right. and. 
Um, so it's just... It's part of the whole culture. It really works. is, yeah. Um, and then one of the ideas, uh, the Olympic Committee is going to work to give athletes more representation in governance decisions um, and that they have a seat at the table. Uh, maybe does anyone have recommendations on ways to enhance the role of athletes within the U.S. Olympic Committee and national governing bodies of sports? Anyone? Mr. Marisi. How, how to do it? I mean, certainly the number of representatives should be vastly increased. I've, I've always uh, said, at least in the figure skating world, that the, that the officials stay in the nicest hotels, they get the best accommodations, they, get, they, they, they have the most uh, comfortable life, whereas the athletes stay in, room, in rooms with two or four people uh, because they're considered uh, down the food chain. But in reality, the, the officials never would, would have been there would never have been there if the athletes weren't participating. Exactly. Uh, I, I, I think that that, that mentality is, I mean, stupid. I mean, I have, I've always thought that. I, I never understood why, why athletes were, were put down uh, the food chain. And I think that, that, that they for sure should be the, the leaders in, of the organization rather than the uh, So the having more child. on these governing bodies and the U.S. Olympic Committee for a place would to start, help for with sure. some of these the cultural issues, I would think, that would lead to changes even outside of the reporting of um, sexual assault. Absolutely. Yeah, All right. I Go also, ahead. Yeah, yeah, I also Emma. think... Um, a few things like so we had I think it was across all Olympic sports you have two athlete reps per sport and mm -hmm. um, over the years they changed if they had to be male and female etc but um, so after I was abused uh, Andy Gable's best friend was the athlete rep so I wasn't gonna tell her mm -hmm. um, once he stopped skating everyone's like well then why didn't you come forward well he was the president of US speed skating <laughs> right so um, and uh, he came up to me like a month after it stopped and he came up to me in the stands and he's like have you told anyone so he knew like right after it stopped it was wrong two years later we're at england at the world championships at a banquet and he corners me and he's like have you told this person have you told this person so like it doesn't stop mm -hmm. you know and then um i went up to he was the president of u.s speed skating and i was typically known as maybe one of the louder, feistier ones on the team. And so people asked me to go to mm -hmm. the President Andy and report on somebody else. Right. And I said, this is what's going on with this trainer who's employed by the USOC. And he's like, so what's the big deal? Uh huh. And looks at me with that smirk of like, yeah. and, and I, I mean, I was standing high and he was low and he just looked me up and down was like, and so it's like when that becomes the leadership, that's the problem, and it trickling down from there is not going to change it. So having um, more athletes involved is going to be a very, very exactly. big idea. So expanding the definition of an athlete, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, I would love to be involved, but I've long since timed out of being able to be involved. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't think you would have smirked at anyone. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Really appreciate your leadership and courage. Senator, thank you very much. Now, Senator Capito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the hearing, and thank all of you. Your stories are very compelling. Uh, they're very uh, impactful, I believe, and will be, have been already, and will continue to be. And so I thank you for that. Um, I have a couple sort of questions of, of during the time. I, I know as, as athletes, you all have psychological um, trainers, people that come in, because a lot of sports is not just your bodies. A lot of it's your mind at the same time. So I would imagine you had access to a psychologist during the time. Is that part of your train? No. No, that surprises me. Yes. If we wanted, when we lived at the Olympic Training Center, if you wanted to, you could. It wasn't necessarily a very cool thing to do, but I went and did it. We would, I mean, we would have to find our own. It wasn't a yeah. part of yeah. you know, the national team or USA Gymnastics. Right. We, I actually worked with one for a little bit of time, uh, but the, the, the thinking at the time when I, was a, when I was a skater was that the sports psychologist had a, had a much, the propensity of messing you up mentally was much higher than helping you. And so you, you, you only used one if you were uh, uh, already a mess. Well, in thinking of ways to you know, improve the system, since you have access to that type of uh, professionalism, you, you would think that part of the protocol of, you know, why isn't she performing very well this morning, or, 
or you know, is there something else going on? You would think that that would be part of the protocol, and I hope that it would be, it will become moving forward that you equip those psychologists with that kind of. Um, yes, did you want to say something? Yeah, I, I so I did um, work with a psychologist that they provided, and I just didn't really click with her, and I didn't really trust her. It is very personal. Um, and find out later, she was actually one of the people advocating for Larry Nassar when I first came forward. Yeah. Um, so again, somebody that has made a lot of money from our sport, who is, still makes a lot of money from our sport. And I know of other instances where she worked with athletes and groups of athletes at gyms and you know, um, compromised their confidentiality by telling their coaches everything. And then the gymnasts once again get in trouble. So, again, one of the, it seems like everyone who works, you know, for them or are with them, in my mind. Right. It becomes part of the system, maybe, mm -hmm. is what you're saying. Uh, I'm going to change topics. Can I topics. answer one question on that? Yes, certainly. I, I think what you're, you're making a really good point in that psychology is a huge aspect of sports. But you said, why isn't she performing well today? Well, these two have Olympic medals, right? So they perform pretty freaking well. However, imagine if they weren't concerned about being molested or raped, how well they would have performed. Right. Well, I was thinking you, more. I'm not saying like you yeah. specifically, but like, so that whole extra level of thinking about, yeah, USA Gymnastics is a really good sport. We don't really need to worry about that. When it's actually like, USA should, Gymnastics should be killing it everywhere because these girls shouldn't have to be worried about that. You know, and so um, also it's, I mean, I went to sports psychologists and all sorts of shrinks for years and never told anyone. Right. Well, you know? I, I know. I, and I'm thinking maybe this is an avenue to, to improve 100%. the situation. Yeah. Um, drugs. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, there's a lot of pain with injury and uh, every sport has this. And we have heard numerous testimony through all of our committees that a lot of opioid addiction occurs after a sports injury and has occurred after sports injuries. Um, I think one, at least one of the young ladies that was involved in the, in the case against Larry Nasser did say that she had been drugged or had taken drugs. I'm interested in, in was that occurring at the same time or if it was occurring? And then it, the question becomes what kind of oversight over a physician, does anybody have over what kind of drugs are being dispensed and at, at what kind of frequency? So we'll just cut to go down the, yes. Anybody? Yeah. Well, there are no medical records. Like being, they don't, they don't have any medical records, whether they're destroyed or they just didn't take any. So Sounds convenient. <laughs> looking back, um, we don't know. I don't even know what medications they were giving me. Obviously, Larry Nassar yeah. was the one um, administering them. So um, it's, yeah, it's just very... Like, there's no record of it. It's really hard to, to tell. Yeah, and I think that that would be a, 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 a as, as everything becomes more and more public, I think this is something that is probably going to be uh, more pervasive than what we really uh, know at this speed point. speed skating, we would have yeah. to, the trainer told us that when he goes back, he would empty out the, you know, the drug tackle box, and it was like he dispensed this, this, and this, and then they'd say what athlete that went to. You would think. Yeah, that's what happened in That's a, what happens in a hospital so or a doctor's saying, office like, or something like that. Again, picking a sport that they're doing so well to let it slip by, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, last question is, um, well, first of all, on the social media bullying, this is a real problem for me uh, as uh, now the new grandmother of four girls. Uh, but anyway, just young people in general, I think it's a real problem. And, and you mentioned it in your testimony how when you came forward, you were social uh, you, you experience social bullying, so I, I'm very interested in that, but I'm going to jump to this other question because you all participate in international sports. Is this a problem internationally in every other country? Uh, I'm sure you talk to your fellow athletes as you're traveling around, especially since this has become public. Uh, have you heard or talked with anybody in other countries where this is an issue, and do they have a better protocol for handling these kinds of things? So I'll start with you. The truth is, I'm not. I'm not aware of of uh, how other people, uh, other people in other countries, handle it to, to any large degree. I, I, I know that different cultures have different ways of of thinking about these types of situations, and uh, uh, in some countries, I'm sorry to sorry to say, but the culture is that that this is almost normal. That it's that it's what guys do. 
uh, the athletes are sort of throwaways. And the athletes are sort of throw, throwaways, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, there was a really terrible, terrible uh, situation that recently fell out in USA Canada or US or speed skating Canada. Um, so yeah, I mean, it does happen in skating around the world. Yeah. I don't. I don't know of any. Yeah. Specifically, if mm -hmm. I had to guess, I would say probably mm -hmm. yes, considering the nature of our sport. Right. I would uh, agree with Jordan. I don't yeah. have mm -hmm. any direct examples of it. All right. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Senator Capito. Uh, we've been joined by the chairman of the full Commerce Committee, Senator Thune, and I would recognize him now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, both you and Senator Blumenthal for holding the hearing and for your continued work to protect American athletes. And I'd join the uh, senator from West Virginia in um, having raised daughters who are competitive athletes and now in the, the grandkids season of life, it is something that really weighs heavily, um, particularly when you hear of the experiences that uh, many of you have had. And so we are very grateful for your courage to speak out. As a result of that, there is uh, one monster who's behind bars and national governing bodies that have new mandatory re reporting requirements. Um, so you're you are making a difference, thank you for doing it. Um, the USOC has a new and, ambigu un and unambiguous duty, I should say, now too, to promote a safe environment in sports, and a duly authorized US Center for Safe Sport is armed with new tools and access to federal funds to ensure it will operate as an independent and effective backstop. Uh, again, a great tribute to uh, the work that you all have done. It's been a sad chapter for um, Olympic athletes, but our recently enacted legislation does send a message to adults in positions of authority that nothing you ever do in athletics is as important as how you respond when an abused child asks for help. So these and other reforms are only happening because brave athletes stood up and called out uh, that wrongdoing to stop abuse. While I wish it were under different circumstances, I have had the pleasure of meeting with Ms. Weber and Ms. Dancher uh, earlier this year, um, have not had that opportunity with Ms. Farrell or Mr. Uh, Morizi, but I want to welcome you both here as well uh, today. Um, my question has to do, and this is for our gymnasts, uh, Ms. Dancher and Ms. Weber. When we met previously, uh, we discussed the role of the USOC in overseeing both the uh, NGBs and athlete, athlete safety in general. Um, as the committee looked deeper into these issues, I was disturbed to learn that in legal proceedings involving another uh, national governing uh, body, the USA Taekwondo, the USOC took the position that the committee did not have a responsibility to protect athletes because, and I quote, the USOC does not have athletes and that the Team USA is just, and I quote again, branding terminology. Um, because of statements like these, uh, I worked with uh, my colleagues here on the committee to amend the Ted Stevens Act to make it unambiguous that a central purpose of the USOC is to promote a safe environment in sports that is free from abuse, including uh, emotional, physical, and sexual abuse of any amateur athlete. So the question I have is with this clarification, do you believe that the USOC responsibility, uh, the USC's, USOC's responsibility, I should say, uh, to protect athletes is now clear. And I would direct that to Ms. Dancher and Ms. Weber. I, if you mean, I, I think it's clear that uh, they need to be responsible for that and that they need to have a thorough investigation of the USOC as well. Um, and I think I just, like, when I hear statements like that, it doesn't, sadly, it just doesn't really surprise me. Um, because that was our experience with USA Gymnastics. And if USA Gymnastics is supposed to answer to the USOC and that's the reaction, then obviously the problem, it just gets worse and worse. Yeah. I would agree with Jamie. And also, um, I mean, after many people came forward and said that Larry Nassar had abused them, um, we didn't, I mean, I didn't get a phone call from anybody at USOC asking anything until after I gave a victim impact statement in January. Um, about a month and a half later, I got a call from Scott Blackman. Um, so 
I mean, it, it almost had, it's this, like this feeling, I feel this with USA Gymnastics as well. If you're not a currently competing athlete, you're not very relevant. They don't really care anymore. Um, whereas if it was somebody like Simone Biles, who's still currently competing for USA Gymnastics in the USOC, you know, they're going to care and they're going to make sure they listen to her and sit down with her and ask her. Because I know, um, I know, I don't think that they have asked any of us to sit down and and listen to our stories like, like you guys are. Okay. Well, I just hope going forward, I mean, the intention of the work that this committee is doing is to make it unambiguous and clear that that is part of the USOC's responsibility and uh, that uh, protecting athletes is, uh, uh, is a, a priority, not only a priority that, um, that uh, they need to be paying attention to, but that everybody that, uh, that is associated with the movement that they make it clear that that's part of the, the culture that they need to create there. So we, we, want, um, we want to send that message clearly. Uh, I hope that some of the steps that we've been taking are helping to do that, but obviously uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of work to do and uh, a lot of harm's been done in the past, and it's hard to undo that, but we want to make sure that the future is uh, that the rules are clear and everybody knows what their responsibilities are. So thank you again for, for being here, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for in the hearing. Thank you, Chairman Thune. Uh, Senator Peters. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman, and uh, thank you to the four of you for offering uh, just an incredibly uh, powerful, compelling testimony that I think everyone uh, should hear. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Chairman Thune, uh, and uh, Chairman Brand, thank you for calling uh, this hearing. I'm not a member of uh, this uh, subcommittee, but this is uh, definitely uh, something that has hitting the people of the state of Michigan, which I'm blessed to represent here in the Senate. Uh, quite hard from the monstrous actions of uh, Larry Nasser, uh, which are absolutely uh, horrifying. And the more facts that come out, the more stories that come out, the more horrifying it is. And so it's important uh, that we address this so it never happens again. And I can speak as a, as a Michigan State alum. Uh, this has hit Michigan State alumni particularly hard. I hear it uh, in Michigan every day as I travel around the country. Alumni come up to me and they they are wonder like how could this happen? You know how could this happen at our university? And then the next question or the next statement they will make is that we have to do everything possible to make sure this never happens again. Not just at Michigan State University, but at other places across the the country as well. But then the second right after that is that they also say, uh, and I want to. Be sure you know that they all say we uh, have to make sure that we, the university stands behind the victims, that the university has uh, an obligation to be there for you, uh, to be there to also assist uh, in the healing process, which will likely take a long time. Uh, and, and we want to make sure that we have your back uh, as well here in the United States Senate. So the first question I have for uh, Ms. Weaver is, uh, what is your assessment uh, of how Michigan State University has handled this situation? Um, I think that they've handled it very poorly, honestly. Um, I mean, there have been, I mean, all, it's all over the media. There's been so many instances where survivors will go to the, um, the board meetings and, and try to encourage them to listen. And they've just been turned away and not listened to and denied. and. Um, offered settlements and just ridiculous things like that, I think they're still refusing to admit what the problem really is and that they're accountable for it. And, and I feel like that's, that's what's missing is they're, they're not accepting accountability. They don't really think that they were responsible for Larry Nassar doing what he did. But um, in the end, even when we were in London at the Olympics, he was employed by Michigan State University, even as the um, Olympic doctor. Mm -hmm. There's a, a new interim president uh, at Michigan State University now. How would you assess uh, his handling of the situation? I would say he's, he's almost trying to fight the survivors versus working with us. Um, I think that, that would be my assessment. Um, Has he reached out to you in any way? No. Do you know if he's reached out to other victims in a meaningful way? I don't know. Mr. Anchester, you, you also mentioned Michigan State University. Do you have an assessment of how you believe that they've handled the situation? Um, I, would have to, uh, I would have to agree with Jordan. Um, and that's pretty much it. I mean, neither, you know, when they had reports and complaints and allegations of Larry Nassar in 
they never told USAG and vice versa. Um, and, you know, I think hundreds of victims were molested even after complaints were made. So. Mm -hmm. As we were, we're, we're going to have, or at least we've requested, Mr. Chairman, you've requested Michigan State University, I believe, to, uh, to appear. I'll try to make that clear. We have set a date, May the 22nd, uh, for an additional hearing. Uh, my intention is to have um, Michigan State, uh, the U.S. Olympic Committee, and USAG uh, invited. They have not yet been invited. They've only been notified of the date, uh, sort of a save the date uh, uh, request. Very good. Well, I, I appreciate that. Appreciate reaching out, and it's going to be important to have all all of them here, obviously, because uh, we have to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And I think uh, I'm certainly going to take to heart uh, the incredible testimony that I've received from all four of you. But I guess I, I, I'm curious uh, when they are before us, and I intend to be back uh, when they're here before us uh, in the subcommittee. What question would you like to have them answer? If you had one question and whoever would like to start, but I would like to hear from all four of you as you're thinking about that. When, when I think back, <clears throat> excuse me, when I think back to, to my particular situation, there, there is just no way that dozens if not hundreds of people in and around the ice rinks didn't know what was going on? I, it was. It was. I look back on it. It was obvious. I mean, five-hour meetings in in the office with a you know 15-year-old boy. The, the, that that's ridiculous. My question would be, how do you live with yourself? How how are you able to be so weak in in, in within yourself to not be able to stand up simply because you, somebody's going to look at you wrong? Somebody's going to not maybe like you as much. How how are you able to 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 uh, sleep at night? That'd be my question. Thank you. If anyone else would like to, you don't have to, but anyone else? I think my question would be, why still is reputation of the university and money more important than um, the lives of hundreds of girls and women who are abused um, under their, their responsibility? Thank you. I think... Um you should take our names out and take our pictures out and put their kids in and see if it makes a difference. Um, and the idea that they are worried about people looking at them poorly by speaking up and doing the wrong thing, maybe a few individuals at the time, well, let them know that there's thousands of people looking at them like they should be um, for missing the opportunity. I mean, my incident as well started in Northern Michigan University and um, it, the police knew and it should have never happened. Police knew and it should have never happened. Like, there's just no other explanation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your testimony. Senator Peters, thank you very much for joining us. Um, appreciate it. Uh, you are, Senator Peters is a member of the full Commerce Committee, but not a member of this subcommittee, and we appreciate your interest in this topic, and thank you. particularly as it relates to Michigan and Michigan State. Uh, we have just a few minutes before a vote is going to be called. I, I do have questions. Um, you know, Senator Blumenthal, I teased him a bit a moment ago because every time he tells me that he knows he's gone beyond his time, he keeps talking. Um, so I assume he feels comfortable knowing that he has already had his uh, second round of questions. Um, so I'm going to keep talking. And I'm going to remain silent. Uh, I'm going to remain silent. Let me, let me ask this question. There's an image, at least in my, my world, of how I view U.S. Olympics, uh, U.S. Olympic athletes. And we put you on a pedestal. Uh, those who are um, aspiring to be uh, U.S. Olympic winners, uh, those who have that success. Um, I think we have a culture in this country in which we admire young men and women who pursue uh, success, who pursue excellence in sports. I also have an image of the U.S. Olympic Committee as a place in which uh, that process by which that aspiration is pursued occurs and had the sense uh, before these stories developed that uh, they too would put the Olympic, the Olympians, the athletes on a pedestal as well. Uh, what's been described to me uh, in conversations as well as your testimony today is something significantly different than that, unless you tell me that I've misunderstood. 
and the financial burdens that come from being an, an athlete pursuing uh, Olympic gold is significant and tremendous. You, you've all talked about grooming. I assume that's related to the, the aspiration to be an Olympian, to be an Olympic gold winner. Uh, but it also could be part of the financial aspect. You, you are successful in financially when you have success athletically, is the way it seems to me. Uh, and so I'm, I'm interested for a couple of reasons of, about the finances, but for me to understand that, maybe if just one of you would describe to me what your life is like as you pursue uh, that dream of being an Olympic gold winner, uh, and what that means in a, in a sense of who you rely on, who your family is. Uh, we've talked about how the, the, the Dr. Nassar, Nassar is a person who you went to because he was kinder and, and, and more accommodating to the concerns you had um, and groomed you to, to, to end up in a particular circumstance. But tell me about the nature of being an Olympic athlete that lends itself, particularly because of finances, to the way that you behave and the way that that allows other people to treat you. That question makes sense? Okay, um, I, don't know, I don't know who would be best to do this. Ms. Weber? Um, I think I understood what your question was, but I guess, okay, so for gymnastics specifically, once you make the US national team, only then you get um, training fu expenses funded. So it's a stipend every month. I think it's like eight hundred dollars. So month. in your case, from age what to what, you and your family were paying for the, the your efforts. Right. So I started at age four, and I didn't. I made the national team at age eleven, which is a little bit early than earlier than most girls. But um, only then you get your training expenses covered, which is well, you get a stipend every month, which may or may not cover all of your expenses, which is medical bills, um, tuition, gas, driving to and from practice, um, every day, twice a day. And, and this is the training that occurred in Texas? This is training at our own club gym. Own club, okay. Yeah. So and then we would go once a month to um, the Caroli Ranch for the national team training camps. Um, and you only get that, that co cost covered if you are on the national team, which is, um, I think, what, 20 girls on the national team? Yeah, 12, 12 girls in the country um, are on the national team. And for gymnastics, I mean, there's not a lot of money to be made in the sport. You really only um, get, well, first of all, you only get paid if you are um, a professional athlete. And for gymnasts, just because of the nature of our sport, a lot of us um, peak when we're between like 15 and 18 years old, I would say. Um, a lot of girls want to get a full ride scholarship to compete in college. So they have to, um, they have to not go professional so that they can go get a full ride scholarship in college. Um, or you can decide to accept money and endorsements and, and commercials and, and take that risk and, and not be able to compete in college and have to pay your own way through college, which is what I did. Um, so it's, it's, it's a difficult decision to make because you can't do, get your full ride scholarship to college and then try to go to the Olympics. Just, that's ex an extremely rare thing. I think only a couple girls have have been able to accomplish that just because by that time your body is so beat up and um, and just with injuries and everything you can't handle it. So um, there's really not a lot of money to be made in gymnastics um, until after you've become an Olympian. So once you become an Olympian, you can get you know commercials and sponsors and and those those sorts of things. But um, I think. What's your financial circumstance? I don't mean this in a personal way, but what's an athlete's uh, financial circumstance while going through the training? You, get, you said you got a stipend. The, is, mm -hmm. Are you dependent upon that stipend for your, your cost of living? Well, we're children at the time, so we're living with our parents. Um, I, I don't know, I'd have to ask my mom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, in, in that sense, it's your parents who are footing the bill. Yes. And that would depend upon a particular athlete's family circumstance as to whether that's possible. What I'm trying to get at is the pressure that must arise in your lives, both financially and the desire to succeed. That, what I was trying to hear from you is what, what's the relationship that you have with, the, with your with USAG in your case, mm -hmm. based upon your desire to succeed 
as an athlete and based upon the financial circumstances, how important is your relationship to USAG to those two things? I would say very important. I think a lot of our situation, a lot of our family situations and our parents, we relied on um, making the national team every year so we can get that funding to be able to afford because gymnastics is a very, very expensive sport, not only just paying our coaches, but you know, all the equipment that's involved and our grips and, and things like that. Um, and I think where Larry Nassar kind of comes into this situation was we all felt, I mean, I lived in Michigan. I was, he was 20 minutes away from my house. So I, my parents felt like I was sort of getting special treatment when he would invite me to be treated at his house or you know, sneak me in the back door of the office when none of the appointments were recorded or um, no, notes weren't taken or anything like that. So my parents sort of thought that was a privilege and I was getting special treatment, um, not being charged for those appointments and him volunteering his time. Uh, so my, my family, uh, we didn't grow up with, um, we, didn't grow, we didn't grow up with a lot of money and there was, I had six siblings, four sisters, two brothers, and they all wanted us to play sports and we all did. So um, uh, we also lived about an hour and a half drive from the gym. Uh, so it was a really big sacrifice on not only my parents, uh, but my siblings as well, to uh, keep my sisters and I going to the going to gymnastics. And in my mind, even when I made national team at 12, um, I know that stipend was was so low, and, and anything at that time helped my parents out. Um, but it definitely was a struggle financially, all the way all the way through the Olympics. And Actually, my main goal in gymnastics became getting a full scholarship in college because I knew my parents would struggle trying to pay for college. Um, but yeah, it was financially it was a struggle the whole time. I mean, USAG, I wouldn't call that really helping much. Uh, thank you, both of you, for what you're saying. What I am trying to make certain I understand, and I believe I do, but what it confirmed is that there is a reliance and therefore your relationship with USAG is important to you, both to your family's financial circumstances as well as any chance you have to become an Olympic star. Is that accurate? Yes, yeah, so you have to, even in any club, any kid, to even be a gymnast or have the chance to compete, you have to pay USAG um, a membership. And so as, as an athlete, we were highly dependent on USA Gymnastics for any chance of anything financial, but we are dependent on them 100% for any chance to make national team, world team, or Olympic team. There's no other pathway to make an Olympic team without going through USA Gymnastics. Um, the, the vote has been called, and Senator Blumenthal tells me he's uh, soon to leave to do that, and that, that's fine. Uh, I will conclude the hearing in just a, a moment or two. Um, and I, I just want to thank all of you for being here today, and we look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you. Violating your earlier statement. <laughs> uh, thank you, Senator Blumenthal. Uh, Senator Blumenthal and I will continue to work together in a bipartisan way. Uh, you saw interest uh, by many members of this subcommittee on this topic, and uh, we're interested in uh, making certain that the testimony that you provided us today is utilized in a way that benefits those who are following you, those who are pursuing the same goals that you've pursued in your life, that they are protected. Um, I, I'm going to follow up particularly with the, with the, uh, the financing circumstance of, uh, of uh, being an Olympic uh, athlete. But I, I also think, I mean, this is what I, this is my view, is the most important thing that we could accomplish here is the word system has been used, systemic is to, to determine what the flaws are in the system such that what I said earlier in my, in my earlier statement about I don't know people who wouldn't report, who wouldn't respond, who wouldn't go to the police, who wouldn't go to somebody and, and when, when someone in authority is told to, to, to follow through and make a difference. I don't know human beings who wouldn't respond in a way that apparently has been, which is so different than what your experience was. And I want to figure out how we make certain that that's not replicated in anybody else's life. Uh, so m my interest is, uh, in, in part, is about how do we make certain that when a, a, a perpetrator 
commits a crime against a young man or woman who is an athlete, there is a consequence such that the behavior stops, the act ends, and that obviously demands reporting and consequences of reporting. So what I've heard so far in conversations with athletes and the testimony today is we have reporting, but no consequence. And that's where the, this needs to, come to, needs to have long time come to an end. So let me conclude the hearing. I, I'm, I'm not really ready to conclude, but the, the time no longer allows me to continue to ask questions. Uh, I, we'll, we'll continue to pursue conversations with you if you're willing. But I always give witnesses the opportunity to tell this committee anything that they want to make certain that we have heard and perhaps you didn't have a chance to say in your opening statement, or perhaps it arose as a result of a question. But is there anything that you would like to place into the record uh, as uh, something that is important uh, for me and my colleagues to hear today? Real quickly, I know you have to go. If there was some mechanism, something in place where organizations such as the USOC or US figure skating or any of these sports were, were mandated to to report under under penalty of a, something that's severe, then I think that people would, would come forward. I don't think anybody's gonna come forward, very few people are gonna come forward because they believe it's the right thing to do. I think more people are gonna come forward because they're scared of what's gonna to happen to them if they don't. And 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 that seems to be the, the uh, a motivator for uh, a potential motivator. Uh, thank you very much. One of my takeaways from the hearing testimony today is this needs to get to law enforcement because the system that surrounds an athlete is to date insufficient to protect them. The reality is that, that if the police uh, were, were allowed to hear my report back in 1998 or 1999, uh, he would have been stopped cold right then. And uh, that would be a great step. Let me make sure I understand that. There's no reason that your report could not have been heard by the police, except it wasn't... Uh, timely. It wasn't timely, but not timely in a police sense, not in a law enforcement sense, but not timely in, uh, in your individual athletic organization sense, right? <laughs> Correct on both counts. The, 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 the organization had an unbelievably ridiculous rule at the time, but, but even law enforcement, I mean, for me, 36 years old was, was not too old. Uh, I mean, that's the, the time when I was able to, to, to talk about and deal with it. The fact that 26 was, the, was as old as I was allowed to, to, to be in order for it to matter from a criminal sense doesn't seem right. So you were caught in the, you were caught in the 60 day rule of your own organization and you were caught by a statute of limitations in which had, you, had it been reported to law enforcement, it could not have been, char you could not have charged somebody with a crime. Correct. Thank you. Anyone else? I want to say thank you. I mean, I felt alone for years and years and years and years and years and years. And um, telling my story has not been easy or enjoyable in any way. Um, but I mean, I never thought I would be here saying this because I never thought anyone would listen. So thank you. You're very welcome. I just want to finish by saying thank you as well. And um, I just want to add that um, I think in addition to the reporting things that we talked about, a big message needs to be sent to um, our national governing body, USA Gymnastics, because I still feel like they don't quite understand um, how this all happened within themselves and whether that means they need to be decertified or start fresh with a new entity. I feel like they're still not quite understanding the problem and I think our governing body has so much power over gymnastics across the country. Whatever, ha whatever happens at these club gyms, they're, gyms, they're following suit of what happens at USA Gymnastics every month at the training camps and with the selection of the Olympic team. So I feel like that could really be um, the sol a good solution to helping gymnastics countrywide. Uh, one of the things I recall, I think it's from your testimony, but recall from someone's testimony today, is while the board of directors has changed, 
at USAG, the actual individuals who on a more day-to-day -day basis deal with athletes uh, has not. Mm -hmm. uh, and that stands out to me as a structural uh, flaw. Um, and I appreciate hearing that today. It gives me additional uh, opportunities for pursuing a, a better outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you all very much. Um, I, I hope that you, I appreciate you saying thank you. I hope that uh, you felt that we were grateful to you for your presence here today uh, and that uh, we want to do things to make certain that uh, your efforts to testify and to pursue uh, perhaps justice in your own life means that uh, others will not uh, encounter uh, the tragedies that occur, have occurred uh, for athletes uh, in the United States uh, under, uh, again, circumstances that I can't figure out how they can be. Um, we're going to conclude the hearing. Um, let me find the papers that give me the magic words. The hearing uh, record will remain open uh, for two weeks. That means that uh, there may be members of this committee who ask you questions and you can respond in writing to us. Um, our subcommittee members are asked to submit their questions for the record during that time. And upon receipt, we would, we would then ask you to respond as quickly as you can uh, to any questions that are presented to you in writing. Uh, that does conclude the hearing. And again, uh, we've said thank you many times today. I say it again. And uh, the hearing is now concluded. Okay. Sir.